Uh, I hope you you are able to uh, to to listen to me clearly. In case you're not, you can just use the chat box option. So great! Thank you for for being present for this for this webinar. I'm Simit Bhagat. Uh, I'm from the Thomson Reuters Foundation. So in fact, we have been uh, conducting uh, such events like workshops, talks, and webinars with with NGOs and social enterprises. Uh, in fact, we had a similar uh, webinar on the issue of FCRA uh, last year, and uh, Suhail and his team has been kind kind enough to kind of uh, work with us and collaborate with us on on a range of issues. And uh, we have been we have been getting a lot of uh, calls, and and because we work with NGOs and social enterprises, uh, we have been getting a lot of issues about about the issue of uh, GST. In fact, uh, many organizations we find that have been grappling to kind of deal with this uh, with this issue, and and we thought that uh, we we need to kind of uh, like engage the the NGO space or engage the organizations working in this on on uh, on the topic. And and uh, like I said, Suhail has been kind enough to to work with us on on this topic. Uh, in fact, the fact that we have more than 100 people who have registered for this event just shows how important this issue is. Uh, so, thank you, Suhail. Uh, so, before before we uh, before we get on the topic, I just wanted to uh, briefly take you uh, through the work that we at Thomson Reuters Foundation do. Uh, there is a small three-minute video that I want to uh, that I want to show, and and then after that we will come back uh, to to the topic. matters that we get through trust lock are so relevant to what's going on today. We've done gun control matters, we've done LGBT rights matters, human trafficking matters. One of the most memorable was a global research project on the right of domestic workers for Visayan in the Philippines. When we started the Visayan Forum, we find some very young domestic worker girls in peace around because they are helpless. So we started also pushing for a lot. During that time, there's no data, and this is where trust look on in. We were able to contribute to the law actually being changed to be a stronger protection for domestic workers. going to be working together, the journalists and the spokespersons, on actually coming up with what a good story is. What is a real story of development that we can write? We were able to be very interactive with each other and with our mentor. When they do the wide shot after the news finishes, you'll see this sitting like this. And it leans you forward, you've got good eye contact and you're very connected with the person. It makes a huge difference. वहाँ पे हमारी जिंदगी अच्छा था मगर वो डर के हुकूमत ने हमारे को पसंद नहीं किया हम रोहिंग्या को हमारे को यहाँ के लोग हर देश के लोग फुटबॉल की तरह इस्तेमाल कर रहे हैं फुटबॉल की तरह खेल रहे हैं जमीन इस देश से उस देश तक उस देश से उस देश तक Sí, pues ahorita en Colombia ser hombre en Colombia es, es un poco fuerte. Eh, donde tu, tu estatus se basa en cuánto poder ejerces y cuánta fuerza tienes con los demás. Y ser peligroso es algo que te diferencia de los otros hombres y te hace ser supuestamente un hombre más, sí, un más fuerte. Pazara Kajujin el Destewan Dina Karisalam el Wid Dreti Chubuhara or Risale. You don't come here to be lectured. You come here to share your story, your skills, and your passion. So let's harness this common desire for change. When everything else falls apart, women are there to hold their families together. Women are much more than victims. They're part of the solution to enduring peace. When a woman says, I don't know anything about money, I'm afraid of money, I don't want to create trouble for my family, always remember this is not her voice. It is the voice of the history which made her. 
Think for a while that if my own child is missing for a day, if my own child is trafficked and sold, what would you do? You are not going to organize a conference. You are not going to write a project proposal. Whenever I come to know that a child is missing, a child is enslaved, I act immediately. Whether I have money or not, whether I have man or not, whether I have any resource or not, I cannot wait. All right, so that was basically uh, a brief about about the work that we do at the at the foundation. Uh, I believe there was uh, there was some issues with uh, with the sound. I would request all of you to to put yourself on mute in case uh, in case uh, it is not being done. And if there are any still any issues that are uh, that are there, you can just uh, write on the chat box. Uh, can we just confirm if if uh, you are able to hear uh, me properly on the chat? Okay, perfect. I think we have a lot of yes now. So great. Uh, so uh, so as as you saw in the video, so we have four large programs, and the program that I work on is is basically is is trust law. So that's the program in which we essentially connect. Uh, we work with NGOs and social enterprises uh, and law firms, and we connect uh, like the two. So we are like a bridge between the law firms and the NGO side. And law firms they provide pro bono legal support. So if you look at pro bono practice itself, it is very popular in, in many countries like in US, in Canada, in, in UK. Uh, however, we are still a long way to kind of get there. Uh, but, but in our experience, we find that law firms here are more than happy to kind of engage with the, with the social development sector and the organizations which are working in this sector. So, so typically, the kind of assistance that, pro, that they provide to, to NGOs uh, ranges right from your day-to-day -day HR related matters to, to various policies like HR policies, for instance, or, or organizations wanting to get a sexual harassment policy, for instance, or, or a whistleblower policy. Uh, similarly, uh, many issues of intellectual property, so an organization wanting to register their logo or any other thing that they have developed, uh, we kind of assist them by connecting them with a law firm who provide uh, assistance like on a, on a pro bono basis. Uh, similarly, we also do a cross-border research, like global research, on a range of issues. So, so looking at what are the comparative laws or what are the best practices in some of the other countries. Similarly, matters of, of structuring. So organizations wanting to register as a hybrid structure or they want to kind of make any changes in their governing documents. That is another area in which uh, we kind of assist organizations with. So if you are already, I can see that there are a lot of uh, people who have registered who are not yet a member of, of Trust Law. Uh, so if you can, you can see the link. Uh, so to, to become a member, you simply have to go on that link and fill up a, fill up a membership form. So the membership is absolutely free and, and there is no charge whatsoever. Uh, for the existing members, you can, uh, there is a link as you can see in the screen. Uh, you can go there and if there are any issues on which you may need legal assistance on you can you can post on on using that link or else you can you can write to us and and we will uh, contact you so that's that's my that's my email id you can you can you can take it down uh, before i would just like to end uh, my my uh, my my slide here and and hand it over to suhail who would uh, go through the session and if there are any questions that you have as we go, you can you can post it on the chat box, and we will try to address them as much as as we can. So thank you. Over to you, Suhail. Thank you, Samit. Uh, at the outset, can I just confirm if everyone can hear me loud and clear? Great. So I'm getting a lot of yes responses. I'm just going to take the cue as to proceed. Uh, firstly, uh, 
this is a great opportunity that uh, Thomson Reuters has been providing to a large number of players in the industry. We had tremendous response in our earlier sequence of the webinars. And also today, we had nearly about 150 plus registrations. And I'm delighted to note separately that we have nearly 90 participants already logged in. Uh, moving ahead quickly into the subject, uh, GST has been one of the most keenly awaited pieces of legislation in the independent history of India. This has been a topic which has been going on, which has seen a lot of turmoil, which has seen a lot of changes in the course of nearly the last 25 to 30 years that this has been under consideration. The first draft of the GST was proposed way back in the 1980s by the relevant finance ministers, after which through subsequent discussions, this has been tabled even by the UPA government in the, in, in the previous regime. However, finally, under the stewardship of the current prime minister, the uh, GST finally bore light and was implemented with effect from 1st of July 2017. Coming into the relevant parts of our discussion and presentation today, what I've tried to do is to keep it as non-technical as I possibly could. Um, in our presentation today, the initial few bits would be about the introduction and the various components and some of the key highlights that you would see in GST as a legislation. After which, we would also try and explain to you the various concepts and the structure of the GST as a law. Moving into the meteor part of our discussion, which is the impact on the not-for-profit sector or the various NGOs which are operating in India. That is something that we would try and spend the bulk of our time in our presentation. And then finally, we move into some of the frequently asked questions that we believe would be impacting the not-for-profit not sector. And also some of the questions that Simit has already received in the course of the last uh, week or so that the participants have been sending it out to him. In case we still have some time left, we will definitely try and address uh, any of the questions which are typed out in the chat box. We would uh, advise and we would uh, strongly encourage you to put in all your respective questions in the chat boxes so that we can either address them during the presentation or else we will try and come back separately on a one-on-one -on -one basis on those questions which are left behind. I'm just going to start moving into the presentation now. In terms of historical context and the various legislation, to give you a quick overview, India being a federal republic, there was always a, a, a huge overlap in terms of the various taxes which were being levied. There was a constant tussle between the central government and the state government about the sharing of revenue as well as to an extent of how the union government will make sure that the pre Producing states do not lose out revenue in terms of the consuming states because that is how the GST legislation has been structured. Uh, to give you a quick glossary of the important terms, the CGST Act or the Central Goods and Service Tax Act was levied and is, is in place for the levy and collection of all intrastate supply of goods and services. This is something which should be directly levied and administered by the central government. And it extends to the whole of India, except the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Then is the integrated goods and service tax, which is called the IGST. This is for the interstate supply of goods, which means that if there is a supplier located in the state of Karnataka, and he makes a, a supply to the state of Maharashtra, this would be under the, the IGST provisions. Finally, in terms of the UTGST, UTGST is applicable on the intrastate supply of goods and services within certain union territories. Uh, the list of union territories is mentioned herein. Uh, the only thing I wish to point out is that for the purposes of the UTGST, uh, New Delhi and Pondicherry are not considered as union territories because both of them have their own legislative assemblies and therefore the SGST Act would be applicable in, in this situation. Finally, moving into the GST Compensation to States Act, this is a temporary provision which has been brought about in terms of the promise of the central government 
to the union uh, rather to the state governments that for the first five years in case there is any loss of revenue arising on account of the implementation of the GST, the central government will uh, compensate the respective states and the money will come out out of this GST Compensation to States Act. And then finally, the SG SGST Act, which is going to be administered and levied by the respective states for an intra-state supply of goods and services. What is GST? This is a concept which everyone has been trying to understand. Uh, this is something which people have been trying to decipher. How is it different from VAT? Why was there need for a GST to be brought in, in, in the first place? Uh, to give you a very simple example, uh, a GST is typically a tax on consumption as against the erstwhile VAT legislation or the excise taxes in which there was a tax which was either on the manufacturing production or the actual sale as against the tax on the final consumption of goods or services which is what gst envisages uh, to take you uh, as an a quick illustrative example the mathematically uh, presentation of this example would say that if at the first stage the raw materials are being sold to a manufacturer at 100 rupees and for simplicity we've assumed gst as five percent the gst at the first stage would be rupees five for the second stage which means the manufacturer who sells it to the wholesaler he would buy those goods from the retail from the raw mat raw material producer at 100 rupees selling it at 200 rupees on 200 rupees, he would levy a GST at 5% of rupees 10 and he would take an input credit of the earlier 5 rupees which he has paid. Similarly, moving to this third stage and the fourth stages, the respective value addition of 300 and 400 would attract GST of rupees 15 and rupees 20 respectively. And each of the third stage and the fourth stage uh, uh, seller would take the input of rupees 10 and rupees 15. Thereby, at each stage, there is only an actual levy of rupees 5 as the GST, which the government will get. The balance GST would be adjusted against the input credit. Also, if you take a mathematical calculation on rupees 400, the 5% GST is rupees 20, which the government will get in 5 rupee installments from the four stages that we've talked about. And therefore, to the government, at the end of the day, the tax collection is rupees 20 coming in from these four players. This as a concept is basically a value addition tax. At each stage, whatever is the value addition which the respective uh, producer, manufacturer, wholesaler and retailer has done, to that extent, the additional GST is payable by them. The basic structure of the GST, um, in, in, in terms of a difference, GST is a levy of tax at a point when the taxable event occurs. Uh, I would have to go a little technical on this slide, so my apologies in advance, but unless I do that, this would be a very hard concept to, to pick up. Anyway, moving on. In terms of the, the respective sections in an intrastate supply, as we mentioned and discussed earlier, there would be a combination of the CGST and the SGST or the UTGST as may be applicable. In an interstate, there would be only an IGST. So to take another example, in case there is an intrastate levy of uh, the CGST and SGST on a transaction of rupees, 100 which is taxable at 5 percent then 2.5 rupees will be the cgst component and 2.5 rupees will be the sgst component while in the same situation if it is an interstate supply then there would be a consolidated levy of rupees 5 as igst and the government at the back end would distribute the respective contributions of the central government and the state governments through its own mechanism, which is not something that we as the compliance uh, uh, persons or registered persons are required to get into. 
Uh, moving ahead, there are some sections which we've mentioned in the graphical presentation. Section 7 of the CGST defines the taxable event. Section 9 of the CGST and Section 7 and 5 of UTGST and IGST are the charging sections, which means they define on what transactions the GST under the respective statutes would be applicable. Finally, the Section 7 and Section 8 of IGST talk about the nature of supply. The place of supply and time of supply are two important concepts. Unfortunately, we will not go into the technical details of this right now. But these are two concepts that you would at all stages be required to decipher and to determine the actual levy of the tax and therefore sections 10 to 14 of the IGST and 12 and 13 of the CGST would be the determinants of the place of supply and time of supply respectively. Uh, this is also one of the, the, the key topics which people wish to understand that why there was a need for a GST to be brought into uh, the law. To give you historical context, there were different taxes being levied by the central government and different taxes being levied by the state government. In addition to those taxes which were in the concurrent list of the Constitution of India, which were being levied by both the center and the state. Uh, Automatically, this led to a cascading effect of taxes as the central government taxes were not available as a set off or an input against the taxes levied by the central government. In addition, there were certain state taxes which were not allowed as a set off against each other. For example, a entertainment tax and a VAT were not allowed to be set off against each other. And for a cinema hall or for an event company, these were two independent taxes. And therefore, this eventually resulted in a much higher levy of taxes. Uh, also, there was a different uh, regime of VAT in all 29 states of the country, in addition to the relevant union territories which are prevalent in India. And therefore, there were disparate tax rates and dissimilar tax practices, resulting in concepts of hoarding, resulting in concepts of companies to set up their manufacturing or retail sectors in certain states of India as against the other states and this was not resulting in a level playing field for the country as a whole. Uh, finally, there were some uh, tariff barriers in on account of octroi, entry tax, etc, etc, which was hindering the free flow of trade throughout the country. I will not go into the exact details of the central taxes and state taxes which have been subsumed, but those are apparent on the right side of our slide. And you can always refer that all taxes mentioned herein would be subsumed under the GST. The four corners or the four pillars of GST are that it is a destination based tax, multi stage levy, a comprehensive levy on every value addition that a supplier does. Concepts which are very crucial concepts which form the basis on which the GST would be levied. Uh, just to give you another quick example, the, the, the relevant sale within a state will be a combination of the CGST and the SGST, which will uh, replace the, the erstwhile VAT and central excise service tax levies. Uh, the revenue will be shared equally between the center and the state while in a sale to another state there would be a levy of IGST. This is another important event to consider that when there would be an actual taxable event under the GST law compared with the earlier provisions. Typically under the GST law the most important concept to understand is supply. The term supply has been subsequently discussed, but in terms of section 7, a uh, supply would be determining whether or not an event is taxable under GST. As compared to the earlier provisions under excise, which was covering a manufacture or production, service tax, which was talking about the provision of service by one person to another, the CST or the central states tax, which was another levy of sale of goods in the course of interstate and there were some other variations of GST 
which were in place in the past, but all of which have now been subsumed under the concept of GST that we just discussed. Uh, Section 7 of the, G of the CGST Act basically defines the concept or the scope of supply. A supply is a very wide term which was defined by the, the central government to basically take away all litigations in the past under the erstwhile VAT and various other legislations. Quickly, all forms of supply of goods and oblique or services such as sale, transfer, barter, exchange, license, rental, lease or disposal made or agreed to be made, which means advances are also covered for a consideration by a person in the course of furtherance of business would be typically covered under supply. There would also be a potential supply for import of services for a consideration whether or not this has been used in the course of furtherance of business. To give you a, a simple example, an import of service would be if you are paying uh, a consideration for the utilization of the foreign servers of companies hosting your website, hosting certain other electronic products that would be covered as an import of services. However, this has been subsequently made exempt for charitable organization. But for those which are being uh, levied as a taxable entity, this would still require to be covered. And then there are Schedule 1 and Schedule 2, which talk about certain specific transactions between related persons and certain specific supplies, which are typically not going to be relevant for nonprofit organizations. What is the impact of this term GST for you? Um, I think all of us are here wanting to understand this bit, which is where we will give you as far as we can understand the, the various impacts, the various changes, how your life will now change. Uh, what we believe is that there would be four pillars again, the concept of exemptions, the meaning of the term charitable, the continued taxability of those nonprofits which do not get covered under exemptions or charitable activities. And then finally, for those which are covered, what are the different compliances which needs to be taken up? Typically, for a nonprofit organization, they would be either providing charitable services or non charitable services. And by services, we're using a consolidated term and not literally services. You could even be providing some goods or some services. But for simplicity, we've considered one terminology as charitable service and non charitable. If you are charitable covered under the definition as proposed, you would obviously get exempted. If you are not covered under those charitable or you're providing a hybrid structure of charitable and non-charitable, then you would be covered as a taxable entity. Um, I can hear a few people mentioning that, uh, or rather I can see a few people mentioning they can't hear me. Is that uniformly across everyone or is it just one or two cases? Okay, great. So I'm going to move ahead. The various concepts or aspects of GST, which are the exemptions. There are some exemptions under the erstwhile service tax regime, which are fully abolished. There are some non-taxable events and then finally the taxable events, which would need to be considered. As a concept, exempted services are being put into three different portions uh, under the basic notification, which was introduced by the central government. Uh, that the services by a person by way of renting of precincts of a religious place meant for general public, these would be considered as exempt, subject to certain further conditions. Services by an entity registered under Section 12 AA of the Income Tax Act would also be covered as an exempt organization, provided they are providing certain charitable activities as an end result. And then finally, services by way of training or coaching recreation activities, specifically in sports by charitable entities registered again under Section 12 AA or covered under arts and culture would be continued to be exempt. What is charitable activity? Um, this is a definition which is slightly different under what the income tax law or any other charitable definition provides. 
Uh, without going into specific mentions, those are all mentioned here, but typically public health services, such as those mentioned under the relevant bullet, those are covered as charitable activities. Promotion of religion, spirituality, or yoga, that's another charitable activity. Spreading public awareness on health, family planning. Promoting educational programs or skill development relating to the physically or mentally abused persons. The prisoners, orphaned, homeless, or abandoned children. Rural area residents over the age of 65. All of these are covered as uh, charitable activities. And then finally, charitable services to preserve the environment, the watershed areas, forest and wildlife. These are all broadly covered as charitable activities in terms of the exemption notification number 12 of 2017 issued in the month of June 2017. Again, uh, just to go into a little more comparative, uh, earlier all services by an entity registered under the section 12 Double A were exempted as entry four of the mega, mega exemption notification. Um, any services by a government, local authority, or governmental authority by way of any activity relating to certain functions entrusted to a municipality under Article 234W of the Constitution, they are exempt today. They were also exempt under our entry number 39 of the erstwhile regime. And then similarly, certain other functions entrusted to a panchayat. Uh, under Article 243G of the Constitution were continue to be exempted under the GST while they were also partially available for uh, exemption by uh, the erstwhile regime under the service tax laws. Uh, what is also important for you to consider are some of the service tax exemptions which are fully abolished now under GST. Entry number one of the erstwhile mega not not notification uh, is now no longer valid and therefore services provided to the United Nations or a specified international organization would not be available for an exemption under GST. You would now have to register and, and instead provide the relevant GST, which will be eventually refunded as a grant to the government by the government to you. Also, any services to a government, a local authority, by way of certain construction, etc., services do not now have the exemption as early available. For those which are finally covered as taxable services, what you need to consider is again these four important aspects what is your threshold limit? What is the valuation? whether you would be available to claim input tax credits and then finally when does the liability to pay gst arise in the first place threshold limit typically is rupees 20 lakhs across the country except certain specific northeastern states himachal pradesh and uttarakhand where that limit has been reduced to rupees 10 lakhs for the purposes of calculating this threshold limit you do need to include both the exempt as well as the non-taxable uh, components in your total turnover. In terms of the valuation, whenever a transaction needs to be considered at what value, you would need to go to section 15 of the CGST Act and the value of service will be determined accordingly. An input tax credit would typically not be available to fully exempt organizations, while those which are partially providing services which are exempt and partially taxable you would be eligible for a proportionate input tax credit. And then for liability, the time of supply and the place of supply are essential while calculating the tax liability. And a concept known as composition levy, which is a consolidated tax without doing all detailed compliances, that's unfortunately not available to a majority of the charitable organizations. Uh, moving on to whether a classification of an event as taxable or non-taxable, you would need to go back to the place of supply or the concept of supply as a whole. There are three limbs of this transaction. We broadly did discuss this in our earlier slide, but just for the sake of reiteration, uh, the concept of supply is typically large enough to cover all 
charitable organization and religious organizations as well however in view of the exemptions available you would be allowed to be not covered and therefore not levied uh, again clause number b which would be talking about import in again in theory this is applicable to you but for those entities registered under section 12 aa there is another exemption and then there would be certain uh, another classification under clause c which can be discussed in specific examples whenever it's relevant um typically the valuation would need to be considered in case for those which are actually covered um uh, i would not want to spend too much uh, time on this slide but anyone who has specific question in terms of how to calculate the transaction value that can be separately discussed reverse charge mechanism was one of the most uh, uh hotly debated subjects why this is being brought about what was the rationale why did the government consider that uh, reverse charge is something which needs to be levied principally the concept in terms of section 9 of the cgst act was if you are a registered entity under the gst and you are buying any goods or services from an unregistered entity then the registered entity was required to pay the gst on such supply this concept is unfortunately no longer relevant or rather let me correct fortunately no longer relevant until at least the 31st of december 2018 because the gst council meeting on saturday the 7th of october has deferred this as a concept to 31st of march and a lot of your questions which were also arising out of this would accordingly be deferred until then um in terms of requiring a registration those organizations which are either doing an interstate supply a uh, registration for every office in each of those states would be mandatory uh, finally those under the erstwhile regime which were liable to pay reverse charge they had also to be uh, registered we are assuming that there would be relevant modifications brought about in the cgst and sgst rules post the recommendations of the gst council and therefore registration on such account would possibly be removed and then finally those uh, organization which are supplying taxable services from one branch to another even without consideration are theoretically required to be covered under gst but again if those activities are within the charitable definition then for exemptions they would not actually be required to get registered uh in the interest of time we did want to pick up a few of the frequently asked questions uh what about goods sold by charitable trust this was something i just read in one of the chat questions as well typically if you're selling goods which are outside the definition of charitable activities then obviously you would need to pay the relevant gst on such goods is gst applicable on training programs camps and events conducted by charitable trust again uh, if a charitable trust is conducting such uh, events which are either subsidized or effectively free for participants then it would not be considered as a commercial activity and outside the gst purview uh, if there is any services which are towards arts and culture or sports by a charitable entity they would also be exempt from gst um another question which came, which comes up often is what happens when uh, various trusts rent out a religious place for the general public at large uh, there is an exemption but this exemption is restricted in certain monetary limits which are mentioned here in below uh, uh rupees 1000 rupees 10000 as the case may be so as long as you are covered within those exemptions or those limits you would be exempt beyond which you would have to charge gst um another question is that whether there should be a requirement to register under multiple states yes uh, in case you are a taxable entity and providing taxable services from different branches in different states then yes you would be required to uh, get yourself registered under the respective states in which you are operating 
Um, obviously, the logical question is what are now the consequences of not getting yourself registered? Um, even though the revenue secretary in one of his uh, informal conversations with the media did say that the government would go soft for non-compliance of procedural matters. However, in law, there is obviously a penal interest which you would need to be paying. We all hope that the government would go slow and would not typically require uh, heavy penalties or these interest levies for bona fide mistakes of people. Um, returns under GST, this is a concept which we will very, very briefly touch upon, but just for the sake of giving you clarity, there are various returns which need to be filed by registered entities, whether charitable or not. Uh, you would need to file these returns. If you are a taxpayer under the regular scheme, the GSTR 1, 2 and 3 returns besides the annual returns need to be filed. Typically, composition scheme would not be available to the nonprofit organization, while for other categories like casual, non-resident, ISD, etc., there are these relevant provisions. Again, uh, a lot of it is possibly not relevant now in view of the GST Council meeting of last week, where they've come out with relaxations, which we will briefly touch upon in, in, in less than a minute. Uh, without scaring anyone, but this is the reality. These are all the returns that you need to be filing in case you are registered and in case you are obligated to file. These are returns which need to be filed for each respective state in which you are registered. This compliance burden is possibly what will give you an idea of the huge hue and cry which is going about in the industry. Imagine a situation if you're operating in 29 different states, all of which require for registration, then you would possibly have three returns on monthly basis multiplied by the 29 states, multiplied by the 12 returns that you need to be filed for every month, and finally the annual returns. And this number would be in the range of nearly 500 returns which need to be filed for such an entity and all other compliances which it anyway needs to do. Having said that, this is one of the reasons why the GSC Council decided that in their meeting of, of last week, they would have been providing various uh, relaxations. Some of these uh, uh, recommendations which have been made, again to repeat, these are recommendations. These are not the law as of today. There would need to be specific notifications to come up. Having said that, it most likely would, they would get passed as it is. Uh, one of the relevant examples and possibly another question for you is, whether those cases which were providing an interstate taxable supply, whether the threshold limit of 20 lakhs was applicable. Earlier, this was not the case. And even if you're providing 100 rupees of taxable services to a different state, you had to get yourself registered. This is a very welcome change for the small and medium businesses. They would no longer require to get themselves registered. Also, for those businesses with a turnover up to 1.5 crores, they would now be required to file quarterly returns instead of the monthly returns from the third quarter of this year, which means with effect from October. However, they would still need to be filing monthly GSTR 3B for all months up till December 2017. Uh, the reverse charge mechanism, that's something which we did touch upon briefly again, but just for the sake of repetition. Reverse charge mechanism under Section 9 and Section 5 of the respective statutes has been suspended till 31st of March 2018, which means that if you now as a registered entity buy even if from an unregistered entity, you are no longer obligated to pay reverse charge GST or RCM as a concept that we have touched upon. Again, uh, these are some relaxations which have been brought about for the services provided through the central government and the respective states. These would be something which would go a, a long way in simplifying the compliance burden. Uh, there was also a question which I read briefly in the chat box. The services provided by a GTA to an unregistered person, including unregistered casu casual taxable person, uh, they are no longer required to be charging GST and this now continues to be an exempt uh, service. 
the TDS and TCS provisions have been deferred until 2018. The eWay BILP system had also be introduced in a staggered manner with effect from, uh, from 1st of January 2018 and eventually from 1st of April. Again, these are all proposals and as and when specific clarifications are come about, there would be amendments in the invoice rules and to provide some relief to the various classes of the registered persons. Uh, in the interest of time, I believe we have about 12 to 13 minutes left. We are going to first touch upon those questions which we had already received in advance and then balance questions, time permitting, can be taken up by Simit and I'd be happy to address them. Quickly moving ahead, uh, uh, one of the questions was if the trust or NGO is registered under 12AA or, 12A or other it should be 12AA. Uh, obviously, this is uh, something which they would be exempt provided they are entering and providing certain charitable activities, which we touched upon in the past. Uh, the next question is something which was a little unclear, but I would still try and make an attempt. My understanding of this question was that there are some online platforms, whether eBay or any other such other uh, instances, any money that you collect through such platforms typically should be also exempt from GST. However, if there is any such levy which they are introducing, I would be happy to separately connect with the, uh, the person asking such questions so that we understand what aspect of their uh, service, what I could imagine was the service by eBay to you of collection of the money on your behalf is not covered as a exempt activity and possibly they were therefore asking you for a GST number. But again, in case your own activities are exempt, you can always tell them that you are not obliged to get registered under GST and therefore there should be no levy by you. But again, this is something I would have to address offline when I get more facts. Um, a, a question was about the specific definition of preservation of environment, etc. Uh, the definition of charitable activities under the notification as we discussed of June 2017, is a limited definition. I would presume that they would include certain internal aspects of that activity as also exempt, but under the GST law, there is no such specific clarification as on date. Moving on to the next question, uh, the GST is not applicable on grants received as long as the underlying entity is not providing any taxable service. Uh, moving on to the next questions, which are in terms of what is going to be construed as a supply under GST and whether a provision of a grant would be uh, obligated as a levy of GST. Typically, GST is not applicable on grants received by units if the other business are also engaged in charitable activities in case the sister concerns are not registered under section 12 AA and also they are not providing charitable activities, you would have to consider the implications of GST accordingly. Uh, the next question is also pretty much a combination uh, of the earlier questions and as we discussed, the reverse charge mechanisms are no longer applicable in such situations and also since the concept of employer and employee is not regarded as a taxable event. Typically, even under the earlier regime, a pure transaction between an employer and employee was not covered. However, a reverse charge mechanism charge would have had to be paid for purchase or service of goods by the underlying employees from the unregistered suppliers. Again, this concept is no longer valid in view of the recommendations of the GST Council of last week. Um, all of the following questions are again have been addressed by the, the simple clarification that reverse charge mechanisms are no longer applicable and therefore a lot of these questions would no longer have relevance in today's age once the relevant clarifications have been formally notified. Uh, any more questions, uh, Simit, um, I would be happy to, to take forward. We have about five to seven minutes. Um, I did try my best, but 
in the interest of time, we could possibly consider three or four questions and thereafter other questions can be separately discussed. Simit, over to you. The overview of GST, I think it has given quite a good sense of the issues that are that are there. Uh, there are a few uh, questions that, that came on the chat box, which I would just like to uh, ask you. Uh, so one of the questions was, what effects will IGST have on NGOs uh, that have branches in different states? You did mention about, about how organizations and how they have to uh, file different compliances. But if you could just quickly also uh, like talk about this. Sure. So I don't think there would be really an impact on any inter interstate transactions between non-taxable entities. So if the head office and the sister concerns are all going to be covered within the definition of the charitable activities and also presuming that they're registered as a Section 12 AA uh, organization, there would be no impact of IGST on such transactions. Other question was was uh, about charitable uh, organizations working in the space of education. So, be it education for uh, for girl child or uh, child or for uh, children with special needs or or different uh, age groups or different groups. So, would they would they be uh, exempt under under GST? Yeah, so my understanding of this is that, yes, they would continue to be exempt, uh, even if specifically the GST uh, exemption has not been covered in my presentation. But under the detailed notification, which I have separately, I do read that such cases would also be covered. And education as a terminology should by and large be outside the purview of GST, unless, of course, provided for a commercial objective. Uh, and, and one more question, Suhail. Uh, so, what happens in cases of organizations uh, which have, which have both taxable as well as non-taxable activities? Uh, so, in terms of the exemption, so do they do they get it for both or or do both get uh, get taxed? So, this would again go back to the fundamental concept of supply. Um, when you go back to the concept of supply, the uh, the activities which are not going to be covered as a definition of supply and therefore exempt. They would be computed only for the purposes of threshold, but not for the actual levy of GST. The GST would only be proportionately levied on the non-tax or rather on the taxable portion and proportionate input credit would be available in respect of the taxable items. Okay, thank you very much, Suhail. I, I can see that there are few uh, few more questions in, and we still have about three to four minutes. Uh, minutes. Uh, do you do you want to one of those questions? Sure. Would you want to put those up, or should I just pick out randomly from the chat box? So randomly pick up uh, any from the from the chat box. Okay, so I'm just going to go in reverse order. I see Neha has asked a question about donation and grant are considered as turnover. Again, if the fundamental concept is that it's a donation or a grant for an entity which is non-taxable, then they would not be considered. But if you have a hybrid structure or a, a structure where you are taxable, then yes, they would be constituted and considered for turnover. Um, Again, the question from Neha Kaushik, um, the charitable activity definition is what it, it is as defined under the notification of June 2017. Uh, what is charitable under the Income Tax Act not necessarily may be classified as a charitable event under the purview of GST. However, we believe that they should eventually synchronize the definitions in the long run uh, because an exemption is automatically being given to those entities which are registered as charitable organization under the income tax provisions. A uh, question from Achintya Rai, is there a limit to what proportion of an NGO's income can be commercial for it to be out of GST? The GST has no such uh, proportionate uh, calculation. You would have to go back to the definition under the Income Tax Act 
for you to continue to be defined as a charitable organization and as long as less than 20% of your total activities are for uh, non commercial pur- or other for commercial purposes which are ancillary to your underlying charitable activities you would be considered as a charitable organization under income tax provisions a uh, question from ravi chandra is it compulsory that an ngo register under section under section 12a to get registered under gst and get gst number there is absolutely no compulsion you would have to analyze this case to case depending on whether you're providing any taxable services I do understand that there was a question in relation to the fact that many PSUs are deducting GST on CSR funds uh possibly this was on account of the reverse charge mechanisms wherein because you were an unregistered entity providing some services to the PSU therefore they were proportionately reducing the grant amount by the amount of reverse charge GST that they were obliged to pay as a concept there is no deduction of gst it was only an internal allocation which they did this is my sense of it however i'm happy to separately connect with the querist samit i think we're at the end of our presentation uh, uh, we'll be happy to separately address the questions which i believe still are unanswered uh, my team will be definitely trying to get back to the participants with a lot of questions however we do encourage you to send those questions to our email addresses which are mentioned on the on the page open in front of you samit over to you i don't hear yes i think uh, in the interest of time we we will have to kind of end it here but the idea of doing this webinar was was not to kind of address uh, all the questions like in this in this one hour uh, we will be very happy to kind of uh, we will be reaching out to to all the participants and if there are any questions which are which are unanswered you can you can write to me uh, and and we will connect with you separately also if there are any other legal issues that you have in terms of uh, with related to gst we would be happy to kind of connect with you and and see if there are any projects uh, that we could uh, Uh, support you on so i think uh, that's that's about it uh, thank you very much suhail for for such a detailed uh, presentation and and we will definitely be collaborating with you for for uh, more such events thank you thank simit you, and my simit and my special mention to all my team members for helping me out and for all the participants and i was extremely pleased to note that we had an average attendance of 90 participants all through the one hour so that gives us the confidence that these partnerships with thomson reuters are definitely something which i encouraging and we look forward to continuing the association with you thank you thank you so thank you everyone